The part of the chapter I want to focus on was in verse 5 where the Bible read, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And the title of the sermon this evening is the Southern Bastard Convention. You heard me right, the Southern Bastard Convention. You say, who are you gonna preach against? Well, the bastards. They call themselves Baptist. They call themselves the Southern Baptist today. But you say, well, I don't even like the sermon. I don't like the title. Well, listen to the whole sermon. And if I say anything that the Bible doesn't say or that isn't just true, then correct me. I don't want to say something that's not true or the Bible doesn't teach. But I have five reasons why I'm calling them bastards today. And they're all from the Bible. They're all what the Bible defines a bastard as. Now you say, what's a bastard? Well, according to the Bible, a bastard is when a child is produced from a mother and father who are not married, who are not married to each other. So this could be as a result of people just not married, they commit fornication, they produce a child, that child is a bastard child. Or it could be two people that are just not married to each other, but maybe they are married, or maybe they're not. Maybe a guy sleeps with a woman who he's not married to, but she's married and produces a child, that's a bastard child. That's an illegitimate child. It means it doesn't have legitimacy. It wasn't born within the bounds of that marriage, so it's a bastard according to the Bible. Now go to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. Now the, the Southern Bastard Convention is a Christian denomination in the United States. It claims to have 15 million members in two, as of 2015. Now if you just throw out the Catholics who are not Christian, you'll ask them, hey, are you Christian? They'll say, no, we're Catholic. Okay. If you just throw them out, the Southern Bastards are the largest group. They're the next largest group. Now, they're not even close in number. I mean, the, the Catholics way outnumber the, this SBC. But the SBC is pretty much the largest denomination that you'll see. And they, they, they're a mainline denomination. Say, so what's a denomination? It's basically a group all saying that they have a particular belief set. So if you asked us, you know, we'd say we're Baptist. Okay. But that doesn't mean that we're yoked up with every Baptist on this planet. That just kind of gives you an idea of what, our, what we're about, what we believe. So sometimes you'd say in currency or in money, what's the denomination? You'd say it's a $5 bill. It's a $1 bill. That doesn't mean that every $5 bill is linked to every single other $5 bill. It just means that's what it represents, okay? So we being a Baptist church, it represents a set of beliefs or a set of values that most Baptists would pretty much adhere to, okay? But we are independent fundamental Baptists, meaning we don't have some group we don't have some association. There's not some pastor over the pastor and then a pastor over him and then some king or some government. No, this is our authority. This is the ruler of this church. This is the ruler of this house. And the person that's deciding what's right or wrong is me. That's the authority structure. You say, I don't like that structure. Well, go find another church and you'll figure out they have a lot of layers in between all that authority structure. Now look at Deuteronomy 23 verse 1. It says, he that is wounded in the stones or at this privy member cut off shall not enter in the congregation of the Lord. Now, that's really good advice. Trannies are not welcome in the church. I don't care if you cut yourself off. You're still a guy that had his privy member cut off. You're not a female all of a sudden. And guess what? You're not welcome in God's church. You're not welcome in this house. Let's look at verse two. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his 10th generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. So in the Old Testament, if there was a child born as a bastard child, not through a legitimate marriage, he was not able to go to church till his 10th generation. That's some serious punishment. That's some serious... What do you think God thinks about this sin? It's pretty serious, isn't it? Now, luckily in the New Testament, which is called the Better Testament, this is not a requirement. This is not a statute that a bastard wouldn't be allowed into the church, okay? There's plenty of people that are bastard children today, unfortunately. And they can still, you know, come into the church. 
but it doesn't mean that the sin is any less sinful. It's still a wicked sin in the eyes of God. So go to Matthew chapter number seven. Matthew chapter number seven. And this is not a, this is not a sermon that I just woke up yesterday and thought, hey, I should just preach this. This is actually a sermon that I've been thinking about for the last two years. I've had, I've had this sermon. I've been thinking about it, looking at different verses, planning. I mean, this is not something that I just thought of one day randomly. This is something that's taken a lot of preparation, a lot of work, a lot of study. Sometimes I wish, you know, my voice was a little bit stronger today so I could scream and yell as much as I need to, but hard preaching doesn't have to be loud. Hard preaching doesn't have to be screaming and yelling. And there's going to be a lot of hard preaching in this sermon. Go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. What is he saying? He's saying you can't have legitimacy come out of illegitimacy. You can't have something good come out of something that's corrupt. And guess what? These southern bastards, their beginning is so corrupt, it's ridiculous. There is nothing good about the formation of the southern bastard convention. I'm going to give you some history. You say, where do they come from? Well, back, you know, in the 1600s, all the way up into the 1800s, there was just Baptists in this nation, okay? Different Baptist churches. And they pretty much in, ended up becoming one denomination, one association, just the Northern Baptist Association or the American Baptist Association. Well, there was a problem amongst all the Baptists. The North and the South were not getting along. It says, as eventually the Northern Baptist churches were not appointing slave owners as missionaries for their Baptist churches. So all of a sudden, in the 1800s, the Northern churches, they don't want to appoint these slave-owning missionaries. They say, well, I don't think that's really legit. I don't think this guy is really serving you know, the Lord in the best way he can. I don't think he's a great representative of us. So in good conscience, we can't literally appoint a slave owner to be a missionary. It says that the Baptists and the Southern churches preferred a very centralized organization of congregations composed of churches pattern after the organizations. So generally speaking, the Northern Baptists, they just wanted to be loosely, you know, formed together. Just kind of have a loose union. They'd give a little bit of money into the pot, but nobody was going to control them. They could do whatever they want. The Southern churches, they wanted to just have this one denomination and everybody's just like them. Everybody just pattern just like them. They all act like them. Now, the South, they wanted to be able to promote slavery, promote owning slaves and all the good things about it. And the northern churches are like, well, we don't even want to you know, send out your missionaries, let alone you talk good about it. Well, in May of 1845, it says the First Baptist Church of Augusta, all the southern ba Baptists or bastards, what do you want to call them? They met together and they were going to form this new organization. And I have with me the southern Baptist Convention minutes from when they formed their, you know, or little organization. You can go online and you can read what did they say? Why did they create their new little, you know, organization? What is in this document? Okay. Well, let me read for you. I highlighted a few different parts. So at the beginning, they pretty much just set up like what the organization structure is going to look like. They say you have to have an annual contribution of $100 for three years preceding the meeting and the contribution of $300 at any time said within the three years. So you have to give them at least $300 to be a part of this group. And then after that, for every $100 you give, you could have a representative in this little group to make the rules. So basically, you get to buy your seats. You get to buy you know, your authority, your power. Now, $300, you say, that's not that much money. We're talking about 1845. So if you take inflation in consideration, I looked it up online, it said it'd be about $3,200. So you could have a max of five seats. So if you want to be a part of the group and have all five seats, you're basically giving them, you know, anywhere from $3,000 to like $15,000. I mean, that's pretty sizable, especially for a small church or, you know, these, they're not just the, you think of church today as these like mega churches, but they're not like that. They're like a small group like this would be, you know, back in that time. So to give like $15,000 for us would be a big burden. That'd be a lot of money just to be a part of this group. 
So that's how they kind of set up their organization. You can go through and you can read. They basically, you know, appoint just normal things like you have to have so many people for a business meeting and somebody has to make a motion, you have to do this. So they have all this and then they have all the names of all the people that signed this document. Well, then that later as you go through, they actually tell you why they're forming their little organization, why they're forming their little group. They have like kind of an addendum and some minutes. And I have the whole document, even the page that was supposed to be left blank because I don't want to leave anything out, all right? It says, the committee to whom it has been referred to report a preamble and resolutions cannot but express the profound sense of the responsibility resting upon your body at the present eventful crisis as the integrity of the nation, the entrance of truth, and the sacred enterprise of converting the heathen are all involved in your deliberations. So they say the reason why we're, we're writing this is because truth is on the line. All truth. The, the whole gospel, like ev everything's on the line. I mean, they're saying, look, the nation, the interest of truth, the converting of the heathen. I mean, ev I mean they're just saying, like, this is the most important thing you could ever imagine. You know, we, we have to make this organization, okay? It says... And what is all important, the very qualifications of missionaries are prescribed by the original constitution of that convention, the fifth article providing that, such persons are as are in full communion with some regular church of our denomination and who furnish satisfactory evidence of genuine piety, good talents, and fervent zeal for the Redeemer's cause are to be employed as missionaries. It says, besides this too, the declaration of the board that if anyone should offer himself as a missionary, having slaves and should insist on retaining them as his property, we could not appoint him. So they're bringing to attention some words of the Northern Baptists. The Northern Baptists say, look, we can't appoint anybody as a missionary that says not only do they have slaves, but they also want to keep them as their property. And that's the wording that they want to use. He's saying we can't in good conscience financially give money to this type of missionary. And they're saying this is the most eventful thing. This is the crisis. This is the problem that we have before us. Because why? The Southern bastards, they have their missionary that's a slave owner, and he's been rejected by these Northern, these Northern Baptists. They don't want to give him money. So they're saying, well, I guess we got to form our own little group, our own little club, you know, so that we don't have to look bad about having slaves. Not only that, they call themselves lovers of the Bible. They say they want to take their stand and assert the great Catholic principles of the original Constitution. Oh, those great Catholic principles. I don't know what that means. Not only that, whenever they talk about other people, when they're not talking about themselves, they always call them the colored population because they're just so nice. They just love her. They're like PC back in 1840, people of color. You know, that's what the modern liberals want to tell you people of color. So there's, every time they refer to these other people, they say the colored population or the aborigines or the heathen. But look, there is no such thing as heathen in the New Testament. We'll get, we'll get there. I'm just giving you a little bit of basis information. Not only that, they say, at the present time, it involves only the foreign and domestic missions of the domination. So he says the only reason, the only reason that they form this, you know, little group is because of the missions program because of the pre-requirements of a missionary. And before, they were just real loose. They were just basically saying somebody that has a good conscience and has fervent zeal and loves the Lord. But then you have to define that, right? And the Northern Baptists are saying, look, obviously, if this guy's owning slaves and promoting slavery, that's not somebody that we're going to you know, send out. That's not somebody qualified. And the Southern bastards, they're like, well, they're now adding. They're adding to the requirements. No, they're just defining them, really. They're not really adding anything. It says, in the previous constitution, it knows no difference between slave owners and non-slave holders. So they say, now the evil hour has arrived. They're calling this evil. They're calling it evil for someone to reject payment to a slave-owning, you know, missionary. Okay? Not only that, it says this. So now they're going to really give us some information. Okay? They say, if anyone who shall offer himself for a missionary, having slaves, should insist on retaining their property, they could not appoint him. Okay, this is what the Northern Baptist is saying. And one thing is certain, they continue, we could never be party to any arrangement which implies approbation of slavery. You say, what is approbation? Approbation means approval or praise, saying that it's good, 
that it's somehow a good thing, that it's helping people or that it's godly or that's what the Bible teaches. They're saying we can't be a part of that. We can't give money to that. So they're, they're have, this is such an evil thing. We have to form the Southern Bastard Convention, okay? It says, obvious tendency was either a final subjection to that power or a serious interruption of the flow of Southern benevolence. The latter was the far more probable evil. So they're saying it's so evil how they're withdrawing money because of these requirements, because of these stipulations. Not only that, they say these brethren, so the Southern Baptists are accusing the Northern brethren. They say these brethren thus acted upon a sentiment. They have failed to prove that slavery is in all circumstances sinful. So they say, well, because you can't prove that in every single situation slavery is wrong, we think it's good. We think it's right. We think it's justified. So I guess we're going to still do it. They liken it to a Bible verse saying it's like we're forbidding us to speak unto the Gentiles. What in the world? I mean, because you want to appoint a very one specific missionary, your whole church is stopped from preaching the gospel. Now think how stupid this is. I mean, when you're in a soul winning church, you, this stuff becomes real stupid real quick. But you, you know, you go to these Southern bastard convention churches, their only missions program is a foreign missions program. You give money to, you just, you put money in this plate. You never see the people. You never talk to them. You don't know anything about them. So if that money stops, it's like the gospel stops to them. They think that the gospel stopped because the money stopped flowing. Here's the thing. The local church is supposed to be the one going out and preaching the gospel, ripping face, getting people saved, going out. So all this just becomes completely stupid when you understand the Great Commission. That every Christian is supposed to go out and preach the gospel and get everybody saved. Not only that, they say that they're inquiring for the old paths and the good way. So the one person, they actually name him. His name is Adoniram Judson. And you, this guy is like the beacon child. He's like the poster child for every Christian, you know, the evangelist. They have him like uh, John Piper and all these people. They're looking at Adoniram like, this guy's amazing. This is like one of the best evangelists ever, one of the best missionaries. Well, I mean, think about it. If a few churches in this country were just not going to support you, they just didn't like the fact that you were going to preach, would that really stop God from blessing you to go tear up the world of the gospel? I mean, if you're really on fire for God, if you're really going to go out there and turn the world upside down with the gospel, is a few churches and you're not supporting you going to really change that? So let's figure, I mean, this guy's got to have torn up the gospel, right? Torn up the world of the gospel. Well, I have some information that I found about Adoniram. He worked faithfully. So this is a, this is a quote from a book about him. It says, he worked on faithfully even though it took him six years to win his first convert. So according to somebody writing about a biography about this guy, said he went to the mission field and it took him six years to win one convert, according to him. I, let me help you. He didn't get anybody saved. But look, six years. Now that means he's not preaching the gospel because the gospel will get people saved. If you go out and preach the gospel, you will get people saved. It's the power of the gospel that gets people saved, not you and your flesh or whatever. So then his wife, who is named Anne, but they also call her Nancy, it says, Nancy began a school for Burmese girls, evangelism through education. Now he went to Burma to go preach the gospel, where it was not receptive, where it was not legal, where they didn't speak the language, Sounds like every missionary we have today, right? I mean, they go somewhere where it's not receptive, they don't speak the language, so they can just fail. Fail for six years. How would you still give this guy money? Let alone the fact that he owns slaves. I mean, hey, how'd you do in year one? Zero. How'd you do in year two? Zero. Year three? Zero. Year four? I mean, that's a long time. Think about that. They're still giving this guy money? So they're going to do evangelism through education. Well, first, if we just educate them for 12 years, then maybe we can give them the gospel. How stupid is that? How ridiculous is that? Just it takes 15 minutes. Come on, just open your Bible. So then he built a zayat or a meditation place, which Buddhist teachers used to teach and debate with passersby, visiting Buddhist services. I don't even get this one. He built some temple for the Buddhists? Um, how are you going out and preaching the gospel to get people saved and you're building temples for Buddhists? He would also go to Buddhist services just to see how they ran and to learn things from them. Oh, really good. He tried for approval to preach the gospel in the country, and he was rejected. So he was asking for permission, and they said, no. Well, I'll just continue to struggle here and just get by with my secret church, that I'm not preaching the gospel to anybody. I mean, 
Look, the Bible makes it clear when they don't receive you, shake off the dust of your feet and go to the next town. Go to the next village. Go where there is re receptive, where it is free. He says that before he would baptize someone, they had to go through an intense training class before he would baptize them because he was afraid that it'd be like a false conversion or something. So you had to, you had to go through like this really long class. Where's that in the Bible? Where, did the Ethiopian unit go through an intense you know, course before he got baptized? I feel like, you know, the guy in Acts chapter 16, he said, what must I do to be saved? They baptized him the same night. Look, this guy, this, how, how can this be your poster child for evangelism? Your poster child for the mission? Did they read, you know, Acts? Did they read about what Peter and Paul and all the apostles were doing? The Othium unit. Not only that, it literally says that he was using bribery on a constant basis to oil the wheels of bureaucracy. Well, I guess now we understand why he needs the money. I mean, he needs the money to pay off all the leaders to not let him preach the gospel so that he can build Buddhist temples. Oh, yeah. Great, great evangelist. Great person. This is the person that brought us the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, because on the fact that they wouldn't give this guy money, the fact that they wouldn't or endorse this guy, a slave owner, who's endorsing slavery, on top of all this, they won't give him money. This is why we need a new convention. This is why we need our new little group. Okay. Not only that, they accuse the northern, uh, the northern churches for monopolizing the gospel. Because they won't give this guy money, they're monopolizing the gospel. Ridiculous. Retarded. Has nothing to do with the Bible. It says... They want to drive us from our beloved colored people. Oh, how beloved are they? Oh, your beloved colored people. You keep calling them colored people. From the much wrong Aborigines. He says, we have the whitening fields of the heathen. So they literally refer to black people as heathen. Well, then what are you? I mean, are you a Jew? I mean, in the Bible, there's basically Jews and heathen. So what are they calling themselves? Not only that, they said, this, this is what the Southern bastards are saying about themselves. They say that they've so often protested that without us, they were inadequate. So it's like several people talking in this little line. But what they're basically saying is the Southern bastards are saying that the slaves are telling them we're inadequate without you. We need you. This is one of the appeals of slavery. Oh, it, it's not that they're slaves by, you know, by force. They're slaves by choice. They need us. They want us. They couldn't learn God, you know, without the Bible. And they couldn't learn the things of God. They need us to rule over them with rigor. Okay. That, you can read through this whole thing. This is literally their document that they wrote about themselves to start their little convention. What a great document. Let's go to our Bible, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. What does the Bible say about slavery? Because they said, well, slavery in all circumstances is not evil. Slavery, you know, it's great and it's, it's cool. It's what the cool kids are doing. Look at Exodus 21, verse 14. Let's see what the Bible says. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from my altar that he die. So we're going through a list of death penalty sins. Sins that are worthy of death. Look at verse 15. And he that smited his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So again, another sin worthy of death. Look at verse 16. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So what does the Bible say? If I were to go to Africa today and just gather up a whole bunch of people and start selling them, I should be put to death. This is what the modern slavery movement was like in the, you know, the 1700s and 1800s and 1900s. All this time, this is what they're doing. They're just going into Africa, just stealing people, then bringing them to America and selling them to these slave, to these slave owners. These slave, oh, but it's my property. I bought him. He, I own him. He's my man. Now, here's the thing. You say, well, where are they getting this stuff from? Now, I don't know exactly where they're getting it for their false doctrine from, but I thought of a verse and skip down, if you would, to verse 18. And I looked it up in their false version, and it's pretty interesting what it says. But look at verse 18. It says, And if men strive together, and one, shall, one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time, and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. 
And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished for he is his money. So maybe somebody could take verse 21, take it out of context and then try to say, well, it's like he's his property. Okay. And if you look up in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is the Bible of the Southern Bastards. Okay. This is what it says in verse 21. However, if the slave can stand up after if the slave can stand up after a day or two, the owner should not be punished because he is his owner's property. So they literally say these owners' property. But let me help you. The King James Bible did not say that. That is not what it was saying in that verse. And I'll tell you what it's saying. It's saying in verse 18 and 19, let's say me and this guy, we didn't like each other, we're fighting. I break his leg. But he works construction. So now all of a sudden, he can't go to his job. I'm supposed to pay his medical bills. Not only that, I'm supposed to pay his salary until his leg heals so he can go back to work. That's what the Bible's laws were. That's what I should do if I want to follow God's commandments. But let's say me as an employer, I do something to my own employee. Okay, what is it saying? It's saying, look, I don't have to necessarily pay, you know, anything extra because he's already my money. I'm the one that's paying out for it. So this is like workers comp, right? If the employer is guilty, he's going to have to pay extra. But look, it's coming out of my money already because he's already my employee. It's not something that's new. That's all it's trying to say. It's not trying to say, hey, he owns this guy, so he doesn't have to, you know, suffer. Whatever suffering that I would have for him on the job, I'm just going to suffer with because he's already my employee. But I should be the one taking care of him. Go to Leviticus 25 now. Leviticus chapter number 25. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17 that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So every single person is made of one blood. There's no such thing as racism. I don't believe in racism. The only divisions that you even see in the Bible would be that of the Jew and the Gentile, of the, of the Jews and the Greeks, or those you know, type of things, but they're Old Testament only. They do not apply in the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament law, there was something that some people will point to and they'll say, well, this is slavery. This is slavery justified. So let's, I mean, let's just be honest. Let's try to see where they're coming from. Let's see what they're trying to use to support their, their stupid, work, you know, wicked doctrine. Look at verse 39. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee shall be, sorry. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, but as a hired servant. And as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. And then shall he be depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto the possessions of his father shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land. And they shall be your possession, and ye shall take them as an inheritance of your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. So, if you take the word bondman, or a bond servant, this is similar to our word slave in, in our modern vernacular, okay? But it's a little bit different in a few different reasons, okay? Let's understand what the bondmen were supposed to be. They were supposed to be of the heathen. Look at verse 44. These shall be of the heathen. So your brother, so your neighbor, so a stranger, they're not just supposed to be bond servants. Now, bond servant is someone that's subject unto you that you can rule over with rigor. So a servant, many times, this is just like employees, basically. I mean, imagine you go to the job, you have a master, you have a boss, you have these servants. And they can be a servant for a lot of different reasons, because they're poor, because they lost their inheritance, whatever. And servants throughout the Bible, they're only supposed to serve for seven years, at a max of seven years. Not only that, if the year of Jubilee comes around, everybody's supposed to be liberated. But he's saying... Some of these nations that you were supposed to wipe them all out and kill all of them, you're not going to follow those rules. 
So if you're going to end up having some bond servants, meaning what? Of those wicked Canaanites and Jebusites and whatever that survive, they could be your bondmen, meaning they were, you know, basically under servitude for the rest of their lives. And we even see this in Joshua chapter number nine, where the inhabitants of Gibeah, they come to like, or Gibeon, they come and trick Joshua and they say that they came from somewhere else. And he basically promises not to kill them all, violating what God had said. So they end up just becoming drawers of water and hewers of wood for the rest of the days that they dwelled with them. These would be like the bond servants. But it was specific to the people that God had pointed to destruction that ended up dwelling with them. If somebody random just came from another country, they're not just going to become a random bond servant of them. They're supposed to serve normally. And a brother, never supposed to be a bond servant, or his neighbor. Now go if you would to Galatians chapter number three. So here's the thing. Even if you were going to say that slavery was somehow in the Old Testament, which I think it's, it's a little bit different in the Old Testament, but even if you're going to say that bond servants were slaves in the Old Testament, it was only subject to those whom God said were appointed to complete destruction. Those that were worthy of the death penalty that he still allowed to live. Think of it like today as people that are, you know, in prison with a life sentence. They're basically appointed unto death, but they're just somehow surviving or living. These are the type of people that we see were bond servants in the Old Testament. It's not just your average Joe. It has nothing to do with their skin color. But guess what? These southern bastards, they want to look at people just on their skin color and say, well, you're heathen. So I guess, therefore, I can justify making you my slave forever, right? Because if they're not heathen, then you don't have any justification. I mean, the Bible makes it clear you can't make your brother a slave. You can't make your brother a bond servant. You can't make him, he can at most be a servant, and then he's still supposed to be let go. I'll read for you in Acts chapter 10. He says, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So in verse number 34 through 35, God says, look, he is, he's not a respecter of any person. Every single nation in the sight of God is accepted with them if what? If they're saved and they follow his commandments. You're accepted with God. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what nation you came from. God has no racism in him. There isn't any racism. He's not a respecter of persons. I had to turn to Galatians 3, right? Look at verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. So what does the Bible say? Oh, well, they're heathen. No, there's no such thing in the New Testament. They're all done away with. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says in Romans 2, For there is no respect of persons with God. God is not looking at black people today and saying, Well, they're heathen. But the white people, they're not. And look, throughout the whole New Testament, it's clear and concise that there is no distinction anymore. There is no separation. There's no me making someone my slave. Ephesians 2, look at verse 18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, are you a stranger? No. So if you're not a stranger, what are you? You're a brother. And if you're a brother, did the Old Testament say that you could make him a bondservant? Absolutely not. It is sinful. It is wicked as hell. And just because of their skin color, our beloved colored people, you know, we just love them so much. Look, they would literally have them in the church. They couldn't even sit next to them. They had to be in another section of the church. A saved, born-again Christian, there is no division. There is no distinction. That's wicked as hell. Not only that, they're forming what? A, a council. Now, here's the thing. Let's take the racism out of it for a second, which is wicked as hell. But this is the formation. This is why it formed. This is where it comes from. This is its birth. This is the birth story. Let me tell you how the Southern Bastards got together because of racism. But not only that, councils in and themselves have no legitimacy in Scripture. So that's like a man and a woman getting together that are not married. Guess what? Not a legitimate birth. Because the Bible doesn't say, hey, get all these churches together and form this council, and only this council can appoint people. They've already failed. They've already done wrong. 
And look, our church, if we want to send a missionary somewhere, we don't have to ask some other church. We're not going to ask Faithful Word and Steadfast and Old Pat. Hey, what do you think of this guy? No, we as a church, we get to give money and send out whoever we want. We're going to, you know, and if we have some guy that's on fire for God, wanting to tear up the world with the gospel, he thinks he can get at least one person saved in six years. No, he's going to do a lot better than that. We're going to give him money and we're going to send him out. We're not going to wait and try to get all these councils together and send all these people. And this is the problem because the SBC, they're basically mostly Calvinist and then some not Calvinist. But if you're part of the organization, there's only one sending out missionaries. So you got to send out the Calvinist missionary with the non-Calvinist missionary with all these people. Look, I thought they were against one another. John Calvin, the founder of Calvinism, literally had a guy murdered for not believing in Calvinism, for being a heretic. But now today, I guess we can just send them both out at the same, you know, stream of the hat. Just as long as he's not a slave owner, you know, or is, or whatever. It's all wicked. Now, you say, well, but I think they've renounced that. I've heard that they, you know, no longer agree that that's, you know, a, a bad thing. Well, it took them a little while. 1995 is when they finally decided, well, I guess that wasn't, you know, good. So they came out and they said, you know, we're going to apologize for our past defense of slavery and segregation and white supremacy. But here's my question. Can you really continue in this organization? I mean, imagine me saying, well, when we started this church, we were a, we're a KKK organization and I was not a qualified pastor, but we're not, we're not okay with racism anymore. So we're just going to continue. Is that still a legitimate church? I mean, look, if it didn't start legitimate, it's still not legitimate now. It doesn't get legitimate when you say, well, racism's bad. Like it was never legitimate in the first place. So in 2005, they decided they were going to change the name to not, you know, lock themselves in. Because Southern Baptist kind of locks them in a regional, you know, area. So they're thinking like North American Baptist or Scriptural Baptist. I got their name. The Southern Bastard Convention. That's what they should name it. That's what they should change the name to. Because they're a bunch of bastards. Now, I have a lot more in my sermon. Go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So my first point is they have an illegitimate birth. They're, not, they're bastards. They're not forming anything based on the Bible, based on Scripture, based on what God's Word said. And their birth is loaded with racism. It has nothing. I mean, that's their whole purpose. Well, we got we to gotta form this group because, you know, they won't send out our slave-owning, you know, evangelist that's going to get one person saved every six years. Guess what? He still didn't get someone saved. I'm just, you know, what they said. Well, you say, yeah, but they've gotten so much better. I mean, they renounced it in 1995. Okay, well, how about their belief statement from 2000? I mean, that's pretty recent, right? If you go to most SBC churches and you just look, hey, what do you believe? They all point to some document. They, all, they won't have their beliefs on their page. They'll say, well, we believe the Baptist faith and message. We believe the 2000 version of the Baptist faith and message. That's what we all believe. We've all come together. We wrote a doctrinal statement. So you get all these Baptist churches together to write a doctrinal statement. So well, what do they believe about salvation? Let's see what it has to say. Salvation involves the redemption of the whole man and is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who by his own blood obtained eternal redemption for the believer in his broadest sense, salvation includes regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification. There is no salvation apart from personal faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so far, nothing really that bad, okay? Then they have four points. Regeneration. So, they're going to explain what they meant by all this. Regeneration or the new birth is the work of God's grace whereby believers become new creatures in Christ Jesus. It is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin to which the sinner responds in repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are inseparable experiences of grace. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin toward God. Faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ and commitment of the entire personality to Him as Lord and Savior. Point B. Justification is God's gracious and full acquittal upon principles of His righteousness of all sinners who repent and believe in Christ. Justification brings a believer unto a relationship of peace and favor with God. Point C, sanctification is the experience beginning in regeneration by which the believer is set apart 
to God's purposes and is enabled to progress toward moral and spiritual maturity through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Growth and grace should continue throughout the regenerate person's life. Point D. This is getting kind of boring, right? Glorification is the culmination of salvation and is the final blessed and abiding state of the redeemed. Now, I wanted to read the whole thing. So, you know, I didn't skip anything. So I didn't leave anything off. That was pretty lengthy in their explanation. And there's already a lot of bad stuff in it. But there's also something that's not in it. Did anybody notice what was not in it? Now, for an example, hey, Clayton, come here for a moment. I have a, I have a, I have a, a, a job for you. All right. I'm going to give you one of these if you can do it for me. All right. Come here. All right. Stand on stage. You got to answer my question. Say it as loud as you can. What is the gospel? Death. 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 Say it loud. Death. You can do it. Death. All right. You did good. Try it one more time really loud. Death. Perfect. So he said, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can go sit down. So that's interesting. Now, how many people would argue with that statement? But did you notice that they didn't mention something? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. How can all the Baptists of this entire bastard convention get together and they literally do not mention the resurrection? Ridiculous. Bastards. They're so con you know, concerned about their false doctrine of repentance that they leave off the gospel. They leave off the resurrection. Oh, that's not important, is it? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you. Unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He's saying, look, if you, don't have the, if you don't have the resurrection, you don't have the gospel, buddy, and your belief is in vain. So how are they, you say, well, yeah, but their doctrinal statement's really short. Did it seem short? I don't think it seemed very short. I was reading through it. Everybody was bored. I was bored. I didn't want to keep reading it. It was ridiculous. So it's not like they were like, well, we just Christ and him crucified. Because that's a verse in the Bible, right? If they said that, I mean, okay, they're just being really short. But when you give this much explanation and you don't have the gospel, you don't have the death, burial, and resurrection, you have a problem, my, my friend. How can you justify going to a church where they don't even have the resurrection in the, gospel, in the plan of salvation? Hey, let me tell you what salvation is. Well, it doesn't have the resurrection in it. Well, Paul says if you don't have the resurrection... Your belief is in vain. And guess what? Their belief is in vain because they say that repentance is a genuine turning from sin. A that means not even were you willing to, you literally did. It's saying you literally turned from all your sins. That's how you got saved. You know why? Because they're Calvinist today. Now go to Jonah 3.10. We're going to prove that, this, that repenting of your sins has nothing to do with being saved. And luckily in this church, I'm preaching to the choir on this point. But it's, it's good to get it in your mind. It's good to have it in your mind. And look, a four-year-old can know what the gospel is. How can all these theologians not get it, at, get it right? All these bastards not get it right because their heart is wicked. It's corrupt. They don't really believe the gospel. They don't really trust the gospel. So when they write what they believe salvation is, well, resurrection is not that important. I mean, it's not really part of the gospel. Jonah 3.10 says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So it says, look, he looked at something and he said, hey, this is works. What does God think are works? Okay, well, let, let's see what he said. He said they turn from their evil way. So if you turn from your evil way, that is works according to God. That's what God thinks that is. They said repentance is a genuine turning from sin. So that's what, what would God call that? Works. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Let's see if works has anything to do with us being saved. 
And this is their crowning verse. This is the verse that they love to go to because it proves their Calvinist, you know, triumph. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. They forget that last part, though. Not of works. Not of works. Not of works. Hey, guess what, Calvinist? Not of works. But they say, well, the gift of God, that's not grace. That's the faith. The fact that you even have faith is just the gift that God gives you. So you didn't even believe in Jesus Christ. You just have faith given to you. And you just have grace given to you. And then guess what? You have works given to you. So you're just, you're just like this tractor beam of just doing good works. Now imagine if your will is not involved, only God's will is involved, then I guess I could believe their doctrine that, hey, good works will follow. I mean, if God's in charge of your heart, if God's in charge of your actions, if God's in charge of everything you do, and you have no free will, I guess, yeah, I mean, you're going to do good things, right? So this is why when they look at someone who's backslidden, who's not doing right, well, that guy's not saved. I mean, if he was saved, he'd have the works. I mean, the works don't save you, but they prove that you're saved because if you're saved, you have the works. And this is their stupid logic to point at anybody that says, well, would a saved person do that? Hey, you, you, you backslid? Well, I guess you're not saved because would God really have you do that? Would a saved person really do that? And they have all their doctrine backwards. Now, in their salvation, they have like a list of just like 30 verses that they use to support their doctrine. One of them is James 2, 14 through 26. So they just say all of the end of James 2 is proving how to be saved. That has nothing to do with salvation. But you know what? It has a lot to do with doing works. So I guess if you believe in work salvation, it works in perfect with your false doctrine. I'm going to have you go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Look, all of their doctrine is teeming with Calvinism. You say, what's teeming? It's meaning it's filled with, it's brimming with. They say God's purpose of grace, another section on their great doctrinal statement that they all point to. It says, all true believers endure to the end. All of them. Wow. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know if I was a true believer or not, but I, you know, didn't endure to the end. Well, then you're not a true believer according to them. Look, that's their doctrine of perseverance of the saints. It's the last point of the five points of Calvinism. They're a little tulip and they have their little P, perseverance. But perseverance is only used one time in the Bible. It has nothing to do with that. We actually believe in the preservation of God's people, meaning God preserves you until the day of redemption. No matter what you do, his grace is going to cover it and he's going to preserve you to the day of redemption. Not based on how good you are, not based on how good you're going to continue. That's a wicked false doctrine from these Calvinists. But where are they getting all this bad doctrine? Where are they getting all this Calvinist doctrine? Well, from their corrupt seed. So you say, why do you call them bastards? Well, they're bastards because they have an illegitimate birth. I mean, how, how can you point to that birth story and be like, that's, you know, that's, I'm so proud of our beginnings. I'm so proud of those origins that we had. Not only that, they're bastards because they have their own gospel. They're bastards because they're producing bastard children. You know who's going to get saved from that? A bastard. Someone who's not saved. Someone who's a false prophet. A false prophet making another false prophet. That's where they get all these bastards from. Is from that wicked salvation statement. That doesn't get anybody saved ever. Saying, oh, you have to genuinely turn away from all your sins. Well, I'm not saved. Because guess what? I still have sin. There's still sins that I haven't genuinely turned away from yet. I try to do that every single day. I want the southern bastard preacher to come tell me that he's genuinely turned away from all his sins. Liar. Wicked false prophet. Not only that, they're bastards because they have corruptible seed. And guess where they get the corruptible seed? From the Holman Christian Standard Bible. They decided they weren't damned enough, so they made their own Bible version. The Holman Christian Standard. Say, so where does that come from? From 1984, from a guy named Arthur Farstad. Now, he's also an editor of the New King James Version, but he wanted to make a new Bible version. He wanted to base it on the same manuscripts that the King James was, you know, underlying. But he died. So they got a new guy, and the new guy decided to have an interdenominational committee of 100 people. So not only are they not just bad, they're just anybody. 
I mean, it could be a Catholic, it could be a Methodist. I mean, there's having all these denominations come in and make a new Bible version, but based on the new, you know, manuscripts, the manuscript evidence, and the new Nestle Allen Greek text, not from the text of the King James Bible. Not only that, if you go to the sbc.org, if you go to their website, they even literally say, they say the Lifeway Christian Resources of the Southern Baptist Convention has commissioned a new translation, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. So they say, hey, we, we are the ones that are responsible for giving you this type of version. And if you go to a lot of these churches, it's the only Bible they'll use. It's the only one they preach from. It's the one that they have the verses on the wall, and they have the copyright to it. So they don't have to, you know, follow the copyright rules of the New King James, the NIV or whatever. It's all about money. Always about money when it comes to these Bible versions. So they're like, they're not really Holman Christian Standard only in the sense that they still let their people, you know, read other versions and talk good of other versions. But the only ones they use are this version because they don't have to pay the copyright. Okay, so they're part of the SBC because they own the rights to it, so they just get to do whatever they want with it. Well, look at Revelation 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Look, if we ever made a Bible translation, which we're not, we would ought to be really careful with what we're doing, right? Look, there's been people throughout the past they go to a, a, a nation or a town where they don't have a Bible in their language and they're trying to translate it for them. I don't think that's wicked. I don't think that's wrong. But if we're going to do that, we better be really careful with what we're doing. We better be really sure what we're doing, okay? So if you get a home and Christian standard, what's wrong with it? Well, first of all, if you read the Old Testament, you'll notice this word, the most popular word in the Old Testament, Lord, Lord, Lord. You know what the home and Christian standard says every time? Yahweh. Yahweh. Why are, they, why are they changing it to Yahweh? Now, I'm not going to go on a long dissertation while they're doing that. I'm, I'm going to kind of skim some points because there's plenty of sermons to be preached about all this. But go, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter number 5. So, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they can't even use that Bible. <laughs> because in Psalms 83, where it says that whose name alone is Jehovah, they say whose name alone is Yeho Yahweh. <laughs> so the Jehovah's Witnesses, they would never like that Bible. I mean, it doesn't even fit their doctrine. It just says Yahweh every single time the Tetragrammaton is used in that book. So there's one thing you'll notice real quick. I mean, that's a real noticeable change. Not only that, in 1 John chapter number 5, verse 7, your Bible has a pretty lengthy verse. This is what there says, For there are three that testify. Well, they, they didn't like the NIV, so they just put the NIV together, and called it the Holman Christian Standard Bible, changed the name Lord to Yahweh, and made all the same revisions that the NIV did. And you know, Southern bastard pastor Greg Mott, okay, of the First Baptist Church in Houston, the largest SBC church here in Houston, he denounced the NIV version in, uh, I don't have the year, 2012. In 2012, Greg Mott said, we're not going to use the most recent version of the NIV because it's gone gender neutral. He says, that's, at least they were like, that's too wicked. That's too bad, because it's not even using he and she, it's using like them and it, and whatever. Okay, non-gender pronouns. Well, so they decided they're gonna go to the Holman Christian Standard Bible then. They're not gonna use the NIV anymore. They're gonna go to this Holman Christian Standard. So then he has been taken out of a, a lot of quotes about this, because it got a lot of press coverage that he was announcing this Bible version. Well, he says why he likes the Holman Christian Standard Bible so much more. He says the pastor thinks the updated translation has gotten away from the original biblical text and other examples. So he's saying, I don't really want to use the NIV because they have other problems that the Holman Christian Standard Bible has fixed. So here's some of the problems of the NIV. He says that they were using the word servants instead of slaves in the New Testament. So Greg Mott... I mean, they can't get away from their racist roots. They're bastards from the beginning. They're bastards now. They're still racist. He says, well, I really like it when it uses the word slaves in the New Testament. The NIV, they didn't like that so much. Now, in your King James Bible, the word slave or slaves is used twice. Two times, okay? And it's basically like 
one time in Revelation is talking about Babylon, and it's just saying how these people are bringing in slaves into Babylon, a very negative connotation, okay? The NIV used the word slaves or slave 181 times. But that wasn't enough for Greg Mott. I mean, Greg Mott, he wanted to pump up them slaves. And the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it uses the word slave or slaves 314 times. I mean, it is filled with slaves. Slave here, slave there. Man, they got to get back to their roots. They got to get back to those origins. So let's get some good verses, you know, from here. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. It says in, uh, I'll read for you a couple places, Matthew 6, you cannot be slaves of God and of money. Oh, that's a good verse. Slaves of God? Who wants to be a slave of God? <clears throat> Look at Matthew 13, verse 27. <clears throat> In your King James Bible, it says, So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? So in the beginning, he says, Hey, there's some servants of the householder. In the Holman Christian Standard Bible, it says the landowner's slaves came to him. Oh, man, the landowner's slaves. Well, I guess those that have land are the, you know, the, gen the Jews. And the non-landowners, those are the heathen. Those are the people that we can put insert into slavery. How about this verse, Matthew 25? Master said unto him, Well done, good and faithful slave. Isn't that what you want God to say to you when you get up into heaven? Well done, thou good and faithful slave. Not only that, Luke 19, 17, Well done, good slave. Isn't that what you want God to say to you? I mean, this, Greg Mott is literally saying, that there, he's so glad that the Holman Christian Standard Bible changed these verses to say this. Instead of saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. A, va a verse that people love and quote and know. He should have said slave, though. I mean, that's what Greg Mott thinks. That's what Greg Mott wants. Slaves obey your human masters in everything. What kind, reading this type of book, I would think you'd become racist. I mean, it's just slave here, slave there, slave that. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Now in 2 Samuel 21, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says that Elhanan, the son of Jehoragim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath. So they make all the same errors that the NIV makes. All the contradictions the NIV makes, all the problems of the NIV, they still have them. Then they added all kinds of new errors by calling people slaves, by changing the name of the Lord to Yahweh. I don't think they got closer to the manuscripts, buddy. I don't think they got closer to God's word. Deuteronomy 22, look at verse 28. I'm going to read for you. You just follow along in your King James Bible. I'll read for you the Holman Christian Standard Bible. If a man encounters a young woman, a virgin who is not engaged, takes hold of her and rapes her, and they are discovered, the man who raped her must give the young woman's father 50 shekels, and she must become his wife because he had violated her. He cannot divorce her as long as he lives. So according to the Holman Christian Standard Bible, you can just rape women and then they have to marry you. That's not what your King James Bible says at all. Your King James Bible says lay hold of. And it says they be discovered because they were both in fornication in the King James Bible. This Bible's corrupt. It's wicked. It's corruptible seed. Go to Isaiah 14. I'm going to show a lot of examples because I've had people come at me and they're like, my Bible doesn't say that. My Bible doesn't justify rape. My Bible doesn't justify all these things. Yeah, it's wicked as hell, buddy. It does. It, really, it literally says rape. It literally justified rape. It literally did not put rapists to death like your King James Bible did. How about Isaiah 14? Look at verse 12. Your King James Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? The only place that you'll ever find Lucifer is in your King James Bible in this verse. The modern versions take it out. But not only do they take it out, they replace it with something. And this is where it gets really bad. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says in that verse, shining morning star. So they take Lucifer and they say shining morning star. Now keep your finger here and go to Revelation 22. Keep your finger here because we're going to come back. So they change Lucifer to morning star, to, to some other name. Well, who's the morning star according to the Bible? 
Well, look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus Christ says, I'm the morning star. He's the only one with that title. Jesus Christ is the morning star. And if you read the Holman Christian Standard Bible, they also say that. They say that Jesus Christ is the bright morning star is what they say. So go back to Isaiah chapter 14. So when it says shining morning star in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, who are they talking about? In their version, they're talking about Jesus. Let's see what they think about Jesus. It says, how you have fallen from the heavens, you destroyer of nations. You have been cut down to the ground. You said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set my set up my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Now these are obviously talking about Lucifer, but you know what? They attribute it to Jesus Christ, blaspheming Jesus Christ, t saying that he's wicked, saying that he's doing these wicked things, saying that he wants to be like the most high. He is the most high. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. God was manifest in the flesh is what the Bible says. He is the bright morning star. And this wicked, Bi hey, we got it so much closer to the truth. Doesn't look like it to me. Oh, because we replaced servants with slaves. What kind of weird, you know, definition is that? Go if you would to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter number 7. In Proverbs, I'll read for you. Your King James Bible says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So the Bible says iniquity is purged by what? Mercy and truth. Now what's truth? Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So how do we get saved? Well, God extends his mercy to us, and we enter through the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our iniquity is atoned for. Our iniquity is purged. But what does the Holman Christian Standard Bible say? It says wickedness is atoned for by loyalty and faithfulness. Do you have to be loyal to get saved? Do, is your iniquity purged by your loyalty to God? By your faithfulness to God? Well, if you believe in Calvinism, it is. If you believe in work salvation, it is. But if you believe in faith alone, then it's not at all. And I guess that would be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine if you going to heaven was based on how loyal and faithful you were. You might show up all three week, all three services. I mean, you might actually go soul winning with us every single week. You might actually read your Bible. But you know what the reality is? Everyone that believes in work salvation, they're not very godly. They don't really do. They, they realize very quickly that they're not godly, so then they just get out of church, and they just don't do anything. And only the people that are, you know, controlled by fear and intimidation come to those churches, and they just want to get lied to and lied to and lied to. Look at Matthew 7, verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So the Bible says, narrow is the way. What does that mean? It's meaning it's very exclusive. There's only one way to be a Christian. There's only one way to go to heaven, Jesus Christ. It's narrow. There's not many doors. There's one door. That's how you get in. There's only one way into this church. It's right there. That's it. It's narrow. I mean, there's, there's a narrow way is what he's trying to say. But what does the Holman Christian Bible say? How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life? They say it's difficult to go to heaven. You know what? It's not difficult. Children get saved every single day, and all they have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not difficult. It's not hard. It's called rest. It's called entering into his rest. It's like them taking a drink of water, on walking through a door, on eating a piece of bread. Salvation is easy. So why is this book attacking the gospel? Well, because they're a bunch of bastards. That's why. Because they were born of corruptible seed. Where do they get all this wicked doctrine? From this wicked book that they made out of their own heart. It's wicked as hell. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Not only that, in 1 Corinthians 1, your King James Bible says that you are saved. But in their version, it says you're being saved. What does being saved even mean? How, you're like in the process? It's like somebody, you know, you're drowning in water and someone's kind of got a hold on you, but you're not really out, but you're kind of, I mean, I guess if you have to endure all the way to the end, then you're kind of in this transition of being saved, aren't you? So, look, their doctrine fits in with their wicked book. 
Their wicked book is fitting to their doctrine, not what the Bible teaches. But guess what? I am saved. Saved with a D at the end. It's a done deal. I'm going to heaven. I don't care what I do. I don't care what you do. If you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. Done deal. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So he says, look, there's a lot of people corrupting the word of God. But what does the Holman Christian Standard Bible say there? For we are not like the many who market God's message for profit. Is that, does that say corrupt? They say they're not selling it. But you know, the thing is, if you go to First Baptist Church in Houston, Greg Mott's church, and you click on the bookstore tab, guess what you can buy? The Holman Christian Standard Bible. And they have this note. They say, actually, you can buy more than just books. The inventory at Corner Books is strategically selected to support the mission of the church. And on our shelves, you will find all of Pastor Greg's previous messages are available on CD. You can even pick up a copy of his message on the day he delivers it at the Instant Messages Center. So not only can you buy their Bibles and books, hey, you can get their sermons if you pay. Just how much do you have to pay for the sermons today? Obviously, I can't scream and yell at you this evening, but the content's still good. The Bibles, not only that, it says you can buy the various styles of their Holman Christian Standard Bible. Oh, how great. There are not many which, you know, sell the Word of God, except they are. Except that's how you get it. You have to buy it from them. You literally have to buy it to get one. Now, how many people have bought a Bible in our church? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're for free on the back table. I'm pretty sure you didn't pay a dollar for them, a cent for them. Why? Because we don't sell anything in the house of God. We're not out to sell the truth. We're going to buy the truth and sell it not. I'm going to buy Bibles for you, and then we're not going to sell them to anybody. Now go, if you would, in your Bibles to go to Proverbs 28. I have a lot more in my sermon. I, it's a really important sermon, so maybe I'll do a, a part two at some point, but they're bastards because they've got the, inc the corruptible seed. They're not of God's word. They're not what this verse says, pure words. Pure words, Baptist church. That's how you get the birth. That's how you're not a bastard, is by getting the pure words into your heart, not a corruptible seed. My fourth point, though, is they have a bunch of bastard leaders. They have some of the worst Christ, or so-called Christians, they're not Christians, they're false prophets, that are leading them straight to hell. They're presidents. So who's the, pre who's the guy at the top? Who's the guy that's most in charge? A guy named J.D. Greer. J.D. Greer, he's recently appointed. He says the result of salvation is good works. I thought the result of salvation was eternal life. I thought the result of salvation was all your sins were forgiven. I thought the result of salvation was that your spirit was quickened. I thought those were the results of salvation. He says the result of salvation is good works. So because they believe that, if you don't have good works, you're not saved. Oh, it's not works to save you though. I mean, it's just a word game to them. They literally look at their works to determine who's saved. How wicked. They say there's no way to be hit with that kind of force, to have that kind of power working in us and not change. So it says, well, if you're really saved, I mean, there's just no way that you couldn't be godly and righteous and doing everything good. I thought the apostle Paul said he's carnal. I thought the apostle Paul said he did that which he hated. I thought the apostle Paul said it was a constant war and a struggle and a fight. I thought the Bible says that we have to daily take up our cross. I thought the Bible tells us and warns us about the, all of this sin. If it's just automatic, then why go to church? I mean, I'm just going to automatically follow the commandments. I'm going to automatically do everything that's right. That's not how anything works. That's like saying your two-year-old's going to automatically be obedient, foolish, idiotic. It takes a lot of you know, chastening and scourging and training and all kinds of patience. Look, that's how God is with us. He's long-suffering and merciful unto us. He says, faith that saves is never alone. So he says it's impossible for someone to believe in Jesus Christ and not have the works. I guess the thief on the cross, he must have done a really good work there right before he got saved. I mean, he says it's impossible. So the thief on the cross must have just like given somebody the poor real quick, or I don't know what he did, but he was, you know, he did some good works real quick. Not only that, they believe in the thing called double predestination. So they think because Jesus Christ died on the cross for everybody's sins, well, 
then nobody could ever go to hell if he did that because that would be people being punished twice for the same sins. Because if Jesus already paid your sins and then you go to hell to be punished for your sins, then that would be double payment. So because that, that can't happen because of logic, okay, then that means that Jesus didn't really pay for everybody's sins. So that means that they believe in limited atonement. So they say, well, Christ only paid for those, the sins of the people that are saved. Only the people that actually believe in him. This is wicked false doctrine. Most people that are even Calvinists struggle to want to even believe this point or talk about this point because it's just so clearly provable false from the Bible. But that's where he's getting this stuff from. He says, faith is the gift of God. This is, this is your great leader, the great leader of the Southern Bastards. I mean, just look at him. He, just, he wrote a book. His book is called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. He attacks the sinner's prayer. He attacks believing on the Lord Jesus Christ through prayer. He attacks people trying to help others call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. This guy's a devil. This guy is wicked as hell. He's a false prophet from hell. You should, be, you should run screaming in the other direction from the Southern Bastard Convention. Not only that, they have a president of their mission board. His name was David Platt. Now, he recently retired. He recently resigned, and they have like a new interim or something. But this guy is one of the worst false prophets I've ever seen. The guy sounds like a stoner when he gets up to preach. I mean, he, he just sounds so ridiculous. He gets up in his, like, polo, looking like a frat boy, okay? And he, he has this, like, video where he's saying, If I came in here and I got hit by a Mack truck, and I told you that I just got ran over by a Mack truck, standing for you, you would think that's ridiculous because I'm standing here. So that's what I think of people who say they believe in Jesus, but then they still live like the world and look like the world. While the guy looks like a frat kid, while the guy looks like a hippie standing behind a rock band, I mean, it, it's dark, purple lights, rock band, the guy's, you know, in cool, trendy clothes, and he's like, y'all are acting like the world. Talk about irony. Talk about ridiculousness. And the guy says, well, the, the gospel's like getting run over by a Mack truck. I thought the gospel was like eating a piece of bread or walking through a door or drinking a glass of water or receiving eternal life, not getting hit by a Mack truck. What a horrible analogy to, 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 to point you know, salvation to, to point somebody to becoming new, cre new creation. Go if you would. You're in, you're in Proverbs 28, okay. So that's my fourth point. I, I could go on a lot more. Well, they'll probably get their own sermon. They just deserve it. These guys are worthy of an, a whole sermon for themselves, okay? David Platt said that 50% of people have prayed the sinner's prayer and think they're going to heaven for it, but there's no detectable difference in their lifestyles from those outside the church. What does that have to do with being saved? I thought the salvation was by faith. I thought salvation was by grace through faith. But he says, well, because they're not living good, they're not living a righteous life, they must be wicked. Pride and arrogancy. Now, Proverbs 28 says in verse 4, They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. So according to the Bible, those that don't like God's word, they're going to end up praising the wicked. And here's my final point, okay? Why would you call them bastards? Well, what did we read? What was our first verse? It was talking about someone being without chastisement. If you're without chastisement, then you're a bastard and not a son. And these southern bastards are without godly chastisement. They never receive any punishment from the world because of anything they do godly, because of anything that the Bible says. Now, obviously, no matter who you are, somebody's not going to like you, okay? Nobody just has a 100% approval rating, even if you're no Donald Trump, which he's not even close. I'm just using that as a joke, okay? But I'm just saying nobody has a 100% approval rating. But these guys, they're never persecuted for preaching the gospel, for preaching some, you know, red fire hot sermon, for going out and doing anything godly. The only things they would be condemned for are just doing bad things. Like, oh, this guy molested this kid, or this person did something ungodly or wicked, or what, you know, just being condemned for their faults. That's not, you don't get any praise of God being condemned for your faults. You get praise of God when you go out and do that which is godly, and you get persecuted for it. But these guys are without chastisement. They're ecumenical. They're loved of the world. The world loves these guys. 
That's why they're so popular. That's why they have, you know, they do all kinds of things to embrace the world. You go to their churches, it's like a rock band. Unsaved people love coming into that church. Now, guess what? If we brought in 100 unsaved people to hear this morning's sermon, most of them would have walked out. Most of them would have got offended and never came back. Because why? The world doesn't like the Bible. It's not me. If I got up and preached a cool message, they would all like it. Okay? It's not, it's not me. It's not necessarily the building. It's the message. And when you preach the truth, unsaved people a lot of times don't like the truth. Now, obviously, some of them could get saved. Some of them could like the truth. But I'm just saying as a whole, that's not going to happen. But their churches are filled with unsaved people that love going there. They love that church. They, 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 would, they would never want to leave it. Why? Because they're ecumenical, because they love that which is worldly and not godly. They have all the rock and roll. They have the bookstore. They got Starbucks in the lobby. I mean, who doesn't want to get a Starbucks? You know, buy a Starbucks and buy the Holman Christian Center Bible and buy the T-shirt and buy all this stuff and spend all your money. I mean, I try to give it away free and I can't get rid of all of it. But they literally praise the wicked, okay? They, I went to a Southern Baptist church, and they were getting up and talking about how great the Catholic church was. I mean, a Baptist church? They're talking about, well, we're really just Protestant, any, you know, after all. And the Protestants really came out from the Catholics. And so, ergo, I mean, the Catholics aren't that bad. They're kind of coming around. And this guy, he was a guest speaker, and he was trying to talk about how the Protestants and the Catholics were going to kind of come back together. And it was just a big misunderstanding, the Protestant Reformation. Luther, you know, posting his thesis on the door. Just kind of miscommunication, even though a lot of people are killed over it, and whatever, and there's all these divisions. We're just going to come on back together. We're just going to get on back with Mama Church. Why? Because they're a bastard. Because they're so ecumenical, they're without chastisement of God. God's not chastising them. Why? Because they're a bastard. If they were saved, if they were of God, the things that they're doing are so ungodly and so wicked, they would receive all kinds of chastisement from God. If we start bringing the rock band in here and we start doing all, praising the Catholic Church and doing whatever, this church will suffer all kinds of chastisement from God real quick. Why? Because we're not a bastard. But you know what? The Southern Baptists, they keep growing. They keep getting more people to come. They get more unsaved people to come in liking it. Because they have no chastisement of God. They're a bastard. They're not of God. Get out. Don't have anything to do with them. Now here's the thing. There's plenty of people who go to one of these churches and they're saved. I'm not, ta- I'm not saying like the Catholic church where everybody that goes there is virtually not saved. There's plenty of people that go to a Southern Baptist church today that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they're saved. But the convention is damned to hell. The, conv- the leadership, this organization, their roots, the things that they're teaching, the things that they're promoting, it's wicked as hell. There's no redeeming it. There's no, well, let's get it better now. Let's have another 1995 and, you know, say, well, it's going to get better. No, they need to get out of that bastard. They need to get away from that bastard as quickly as possible and do what the Bible says. Have some godly, you know, fear. Why don't you fear God's word? So I don't think, you know, they're that ecumenical. Well, then how come they have so many politicians that are Southern bastards? You want to know how many independent fundamental Baptist politicians there are? I don't know of any. <laughs> Find me one, okay? Here's, I'm just going to read for you. Sharon Engel, she's, she's of there. Harry Reid, Robert J. Bentley, Matt Bevan, Matt Blunt, Brad Carson, Travis Childers, Tom Coburn. Here's one you might recognize. Rick Crawford. Here's another one you might recognize. Ted Cruz. Greg Davis. John Fleming. Bill Flores. Lindsey Graham. Tom Graves. Mike Huckabee. Duncan Hunter. Mike Johnson. Ben Jones. Larry Kissel. Ed McAter. Ronnie Musgrove. Sonny Perdue. Scott Pruitt. Mark Pryor. Chip Pickering. Harry S. Truman. Roger Wicker. Steve Womack. Randy Forbes. Kevin McCarthy. And Ron Paul. Look, that's just the name of you. I mean, oh, they're not ecumenical. Then how come all these politicians are claiming they're SBC and they're loved of many people? Now, look, let's take Ted Cruz for our, our crowning example since he's running for, you know, the Senate or whatever in Texas, okay? He said, well, Ted Cruz isn't loved by everybody. That's true. But what candidate is? Can you really point to anybody that's just loved by 100% of people? 
Not going to happen, okay? You're not going to find that. And when the Bible says that false prophets are loved of the world, it's not saying in a, in a sense that there's zero people that don't like them. It's just saying from a sense that there's plenty of worldly people that re you know, receive and love this guy. And think about it. How many people love Ted Cruz? He has a huge following of unsaved people that love this guy. But you know what? If somebody from one of our churches that believe like us and ripped on the sodomites got up and tried to run for office, we would have nobody following us. <laughs> I would have about, what, like 30 people maybe interested in voting for them. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be this great following. They have no chastisement. They're loved of the world. They're ecumenical as hell. I don't want to touch them with a 10-foot pole. And guess what? We're not going to go link hands with some southern bastard convention. I'm not going to go start a church plant with some southern bastard convention. They might go start one with a Catholic church. They might go, they'll do the prayer breakfasts. And even in the city that I lived in, every year for a long time, they had this event at the Southern ba Baptist Church that I was at where every church and the whole city was like invited to come to together and they had this big interdenominational you know, gathering for all the students to come together. Now in parts of it, they would kind of break apart in their different denominations, but they're having one big ecumenical event, you know, some youth camp, every single disciple now, you know, they'd have all these people come together. Wicked as hell. You think I'm going to get together with a bunch of Catholics? You think I'm going to get together with a bunch of Methodists or Episcopalians or Jehovah's Witness or, you know, whatever? I mean, good night. Now go to 2 Corinthians 6. Last place I'll have you turn. Ephesians 5 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We shouldn't have anything to do with the Catholics. We should talk about how wicked they are and how their doctrine is wicked as hell. And if you run into a Catholic, try to get them saved. Look, what's the point of preaching against these things? It's so you realize the condition people are in so you get them saved. There's plenty of people that I know that, would, that are in the Southern Bastard Convention. They'll say, well, Catholics are saved. So they have no motivation to preach in the gospel. Why? Because they hate them. If you don't hate the Catholic, then you'll say the Catholic doctrine is wicked as hell and they need the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not, oh, genuinely turn away from all your sins, like the southern bastards want to say. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So if you're a church that actually believes the gospel today, but you're a part of this wicked convention, you need to have no fellowship with them. Because J.D. Greer, he's a false prophet. He doesn't believe the gospel. They're filled with all this Calvinist garbage. You're using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, wicked as hell. They have the illegitimate birth. I mean, do you want to be tied to that racist birth? I mean, that is, I don't think they got better. <laughs> they might have renounced it in 1995, but then guess what? Then they came out with the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which calls people slaves over and over again. I mean, how do you want that thing? And lastly, look, they're so ecumenical because they have no chastisement. They're not chastened of the Lord they're not sons, they're bastards. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you for letting us uh, be sons today. And thank you for your chastisement and punishment when we go out and do something that's wicked and wrong, that you actually love us. I pray that we'd never be fooled by any of these bastards, that we'd never be fooled by bastard doctrine and by bastard Bibles and by just bastard conventions, that we would not have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but we'd rather reprove them. And I pray that anybody that would hear this message, that they would just decide that God's word is what's important, not how they feel or not how they were raised or whatever you know, influences they had, but rather that they should just seek the truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.